Apple's Podcasts Connect, and other changes for podcasters. Welcome to the Audacity to Podcast, episode 258. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Audacity to Podcast. I'm Daniel J. Lewis, and this is the award-winning in-depth podcast about podcasting. It's where I give you the guts and teach you the tools to launch or improve your own podcast for sharing your passions and finding success. In February 2016, Apple has done some really cool things for podcasters, releasing new tools, updating some stuff for us. And these are exciting changes that they're making and could possibly be setting a ground framework for other even cooler changes in the future. That is pure hypothesis. I have no actual evidence to back up that. So that's why it's a hypothesis instead of a theory. But this new thing that most people are talking about is Podcasts Connect. And there are other things that Apple has changed in February 2016, and I'll be talking about those in this episode. So if you'd like to follow along in the show notes for this episode or get the links to all of the different resources that I mentioned, then please go to theaudacitypodcast.com slash podcasts connect. Now, I have to be very precise in the pronunciation because it's podcast with an S, plural, at the end, Podcasts Connect, because technically Podcast Connect is someone else's trademark. That belongs to Todd Cochran. Podcast Connect is the parent company of Geek News Central, as well as the Podcast Awards. And by the way, the Podcast Awards are coming back. Go to podcastawards.com if you're interested in providing some input on some rules adjustments that will be over there. And I'm looking forward to that. The daily voting is not up for discussion. It will stay as daily voting, which I'm in favor of. But there are some other rules that are being challenged and adjusted. I'm really looking forward to seeing how the 11th annual podcast awards goes. So go over to podcastawards.com if you're interested in checking that out. But Apple's Podcasts Connect is a new platform that they've launched to help you manage your podcasts as they appear in the iTunes store, as well as the podcast app for multiple platforms at this point, and maybe more to come in the future. I think right at the beginning, some people may think this is Apple's response to what Google is doing with Google's new Play store and its upcoming platform and portal for podcasters to manage their shows and such. I don't really see this as Apple's response to that because Apple has the domain podcastsconnect.com and they've had that domain registered since July of 2015. That's before Google even announced what the podcast portal would look like or came out public with any of that. It's possible that Apple and Google had been talking and sharing ideas or talking about what's coming in the future for podcasters. But what I really think is the reason for this new Podcast Connect platform is, number one, to give you more power as a podcaster over your own podcast as it appears in the iTunes whole platform there. And number two, by giving you more power, it also means you'll need Apple's support less because you don't have to ask them to do as many things for you because now you can do those things yourself. And I really like that they've given more of the power for managing your podcast to you as the podcaster. There may still be things in the future where you need Apple's help for specifics with your podcast, but now you have a lot more control with that. And even I, as a podcast consultant, can help you better in some ways too, because I could log into your Apple ID account to see how your podcast lists in your account and such. And there's a lot more potential here for other things you could be doing in the future. But before I get into talking about what Podcast Connect is, as well as uh, what you can do with Podcast Connect, like the URL and the media URL, some of the podcast resources and help that they've provided, the new HTTPS support, and some podcasting specification updates. The most important thing for you to ask yourself right now is, did you receive Apple's emails in February 2016? If you didn't, 
then there might be something wrong in your RSS feed or with your Apple ID account. Apple regularly sends important news and updates to podcasters, and in February 2016, Apple sent two emails to announce these updates that I'm about to explain to you and uh, give you some understanding of these new features and what they mean for you. These emails usually go to the email address that's in the iTunes email RSS tag that's inside of your RSS feed. If you don't have access to that email account, then you really should change your RSS feed to use an email address you can access. Here's the really big warning. If you're using a third-party feed creation tool, such as SoundCloud or Squarespace or something else like that, many of these tools will default to using their own email address as the iTunes email contact information instead of your email address. In the case of SoundCloud, that is the default, but you can change it to be your email address. And I recommend that you go into your content settings and change that email so that it is an address that you can access. So you'll see these announcements and important notes from Apple about your podcast and things that affect your podcast. But if you're with a platform that doesn't give you this control to change that email address and it's using their email address, then... Please tell them they absolutely must let you have your email address in there. In fact, it should default to your email address. Yes, that email address is accessible because anyone could look at the RSS feed and see that email address. So keep that in mind. But that email address is not publicly visible in your iTunes listing. So it doesn't necessarily have to coincide with your podcast identity. It could be a Gmail account or anything else. I recommend that it still makes sense for your podcast, so it's easy to manage on your side. But the most important thing is you need to have access to that email address because that's where Apple might send emails about your podcast and these important announcements. They may also send these emails to your Apple ID account. This is what you use to log into iTunes. Or if you have any kind of Apple device, this is what you use as the account for logging into that device or purchasing software, updating software and such. That's your Apple ID account. And most likely when you submitted your podcast to iTunes, you used a certain Apple ID account and you need to have access to that in order to use the podcast connect feature. And it might be that some of these important announcements would go to your Apple ID account. If you don't receive these important emails from Apple, then please investigate and make whatever changes are necessary so that you don't miss this important stuff. It could be announcements like these recent updates, or it could be issues that directly affect your podcast and could be preventing your podcast from reaching your audience. Maybe there's a problem. Maybe your podcast was removed from the store, anything like that. You need to have access to that information. So if you didn't receive those emails, make sure... You're changing what you need to in order to receive them. So now I want to tell you about Podcasts Connect. And there are a lot of pieces to this. So I'm going to spend a lot of time here, especially talking about the potentially risky fields of URL and mirror URL. But I'll get into those in a minute. This Podcasts Connect feature is the biggest news from Apple for podcasters. This is the new way of submitting and managing your podcasts in iTunes and the podcast app. You have to have an Apple ID in order to log in, and you should probably already have an Apple ID anyway. And you can create one through the Apple website, or if you have an iTunes account, then that's your Apple ID that you would use. This new control over your podcast listing means that, to our great joy, you won't have to wait for Apple's support or explanations for a lot of things. There will be a lot more that you can do yourself. What's also great about this is that if you don't like the iTunes desktop software program or you don't have access to it, you can still submit a podcast to Podcast Connect and to the iTunes platform and everything that's powered by it without having to have iTunes installed. That means if you're on Linux, you can now submit a podcast into Podcast Connect. If you primarily use a mobile device, you previously, even if it was an Apple device, you could not submit a podcast into iTunes or the podcast app. Well, now you can because you can launch the Podcast Connect website on your mobile device. And that Podcast Connect link is in the show notes for this episode at theaudacitypodcast.com slash podcasts 
connect. Make sure you use the plural form of podcasts, or you can access it by going to podcastsconnect.com. Because Podcasts Connect is similar to iTunes Connect, which is a portal that developers are very familiar with, it's giving me a little bit of hope that some of the features that developers have and information that they have access to for having their apps in the iOS or Mac app stores, I'm hopeful that that information will also come to podcasters in some way. That may not be the case, but at least we could be going that direction. When you look at some of the documentation that Apple includes on their site for Podcast Connect, I noticed a certain pattern, and that is that they frequently refer to submitting to Podcast Connect, and the language that they're using in this new documentation really makes Podcast Connect seem more than merely a management tool for podcasters. I think what Apple is doing is positioning Podcast Connect as a podcast submission platform, not only a management platform. And this does make logical sense as it was kind of complicated before to explain submit to iTunes and that also puts you in the podcast app on iOS, but it also puts you in the podcast app for Apple TV, but it also means you're available in the iTunes API and all of this stuff. And it starts to get complicated because where are you really submitting your podcast? And the iTunes concept is somewhat a fading concept because people consume podcasts on their mobile devices more. So if you're thinking, oh, I want to submit my podcast to the podcast app so people can download it on their mobile devices, wait, submit to iTunes? No, no, I don't I don't want to sell my podcast in iTunes. I want people to be able to download it with a podcast app. It could be a little confusing there to new podcasters. So Putting this new label of Podcasts Connect makes more sense. It's generic and descriptive enough that it can include iTunes, the podcast app for iOS, the podcast app for Apple TV, any other apps that are connected via the iTunes API. Plus, this is also a future-proof title that could be used to include something like an Apple podcast app for Android or for Windows Phone. I'm not saying that they're making one, although I really do think Apple will release a podcast app for Android. It makes a lot of sense for them to do so. And now referring to this distribution platform as Podcast Connect gives them a lot of freedom to support multiple platforms, multiple apps, and maybe even other devices that could support podcast consumption in the future. So, I'm going to try to stop saying submit your podcast to iTunes because that's no longer what you're doing. You don't need iTunes at all to submit your podcast. I'm going to instead refer to submitting your podcast to Podcasts Connect, and that gets you in iTunes, the podcast apps, as well as many other third-party apps that use the iTunes API, like Overcast, for example. You don't have to submit your podcast to Overcast because when you're in Podcast Connect, That makes your podcast available via an API that developers can use to then access your podcast from the podcast catalog that Apple provides. So you are submitting your podcast to Apple, and it's Apple's Podcasts Connect service, but many other developers are using the same APIs in order to access your podcast. So it's one place for your podcast that connects you to multiple places. So the title, Podcasts Connect, really makes sense. So what can you do with Podcasts Connect? And I have the links to these different things in the notes at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash podcasts connect. Number one, you could submit new podcasts. And this isn't simply put in your RSS feed and wait and hope and pray that your feed is accepted. But there's an extra step of validation and some concise explanations of any particular issues you might run into, which is great because before we would say things like, oh, you need to make sure your feed is valid before you submit it to iTunes because you don't want to have to wait several days and then discover that your feed was rejected because it wasn't valid. That kind of thing could still potentially happen. But the new Podcast Connect platform does some validation for you and will give you some short messages to explain what could be happening or why there might be some problems with your RSS feed. So it now helps you to submit your podcast a lot better. 
Number two, you can see all the podcasts you've previously submitted with your Apple ID. When I log into my Apple ID and the Podcast Connect platform, I see several podcasts that I've submitted to iTunes for my clients. If you log into your Apple ID and you don't see your podcast, then it's possible you've submitted it via a separate Apple ID, or maybe you asked someone else to submit your podcast for you. That's where you might need to contact Apple and get their help to move the podcast from someone else's Apple ID into your Apple ID. This will help you a lot if you have access to that email address in your RSS feed because you might want to send them an email from that with all of the other information. I'll get into more details about getting help from Apple because that process has changed a little bit too. But when you give them all of this and they can see, oh yeah, it lines up, you're emailing me from the email address that's in the RSS feed, you have access to this RSS feed, they can validate all of that and move things over for you, potentially. But please don't burden them and pester them for that kind of thing. It's not an urgent thing for you to have your podcast in your own Podcast Connect account, but it would be good to have all of yours. So I might contact Apple and ask them to move my client's podcasts out of my Apple ID account into my client's own account so that they can manage their podcast from here on out. Or the clients may just decide, no, we still want you to manage it for us. And I'm happy with that as well. Number three, you can see the status and last update information for any previously submitted podcasts. So when I look in Podcast Connect, I see several podcasts that I've submitted to iTunes that have since been deleted. I see even some podcasts that have been rejected or some podcasts that have issues. But for each of these, even the working ones, I can see when this podcast was last refreshed. That's really helpful information for if you're worried about an episode not displaying in the iTunes store. This shows you how recently your podcast listing was updated. So if the last refresh date is quite a while back, then there might be a problem with your RSS feed. Or the other option is number four, force a feed refresh. Now, please use this with caution. This gives you great power. And as you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Use the feed refresh feature only if you know your feed is working And your subscribers can download new episodes, but the updates haven't shown yet in iTunes and you've waited for at least 24 hours. This feed refresh thing does not affect your subscribers at all. It's all about the iTunes store, the podcast app, and really everything here with Podcast Connect is affecting your listing in the directory, not your podcast itself or your connection with your subscribers. There are many cases where you may update your RSS feed and there's a new episode in your feed and your subscribers can download it and start consuming it right away, but you may not see that new episode yet in your iTunes listing. That's totally okay. They have created iTunes to learn your update schedule and update your podcast listing on a fairly regular basis. I've seen it update in as few as six minutes before. I've also seen it take a few hours. That's why I say wait at least 24 hours to see if your listing updates automatically itself. And that is when you know your feed is working and you can see a new episode when you're subscribed to your podcast, your subscribers are downloading new episodes. But if there's still a problem after those 24 hours or something hasn't quite refreshed, or maybe it is very important for you to get something refreshed in your podcast description, your title, your cover or anything like that, then that's when you would want to use this feed refresh option. But otherwise, you should probably just ignore that feed refresh. Please do not click that every time you publish a new episode. That would be abusing it because iTunes is set up already to refresh when you publish new episodes. Use this as a fallback solution, not as a regular tool in your podcast publishing. Feature number five is that you can temporarily hide a podcast from Podcast Connect platforms like iTunes, the podcast app, the iTunes API and such. This doesn't affect your subscribers, your existing subscribers, that is, but it does mean new subscribers won't see you. So if someone searches for your podcast in iTunes, it won't be there. And this does take up to 24 hours to fully refresh in the iTunes store, but this also means in other podcast apps like Overcast, 
that uses the iTunes API, your podcast will not be searchable. But if someone is already subscribed, they'll still continue to receive your episodes. When would you want to hide a podcast from iTunes? I don't know. Maybe there's a legal issue you're facing, maybe a technical problem. There could be a few reasons to potentially hide your podcast temporarily from iTunes and then bring it back later. That's up to you to really decide when you might want to do that, but most likely, I would say you'll probably never need to do that. Number six feature inside of Podcast Connect is that you can permanently delete a podcast from Podcast Connect platforms. Again, that's iTunes, the podcast app, the iTunes API and such. This removes your podcast from the directory in those different platforms. This does not affect your subscribers at all. Remember, your subscribers are connected directly to your RSS feed, not to your iTunes listing. Feature number seven is you can get your show's standard iTunes URL very easily by looking at your podcast in the Podcast Connect interface. This makes it easy so you don't have to try to find your podcast in iTunes or use a link maker. And I say standard URL because this does not directly launch iTunes to your podcast. It's not using the affiliate program or anything like that, which I do recommend that you use one of those to get a more advanced iTunes URL that makes it easier for your audience as well. And then the last thing, number eight, is that you can get your show's mirror URL and update its source RSS feed. And I'll give you more details on that in a moment. But the mirror URL points to whatever that URL is in the URL field, which is your RSS feed for your podcast. And you can update that and it will update in the store, not for your subscribers. So you may have noticed most of these things, actually all of these things affect the directory listing of your podcast, not your subscribers. Changing your RSS feed affects your subscribers and can affect your directory listing. But changing stuff here in Podcast Connect Except for one possible exception, and I'll get into that when I dig more into mirror URLs, but most likely this changes nothing about your subscribers, especially if you're not using that mirror URL feature. So here's the big thing. With Podcast Connect, you have this URL field, which is the URL for your podcast RSS feed, and you have this new URL that's provided, which is a mirror URL. There can easily be some misunderstanding about these because these are, I think, the most confusing new features inside of Podcast Connect. You can change your RSS feed URL in here, but be careful. I'll explain more why you need to be careful and why you probably even shouldn't do this in just a little bit. But let me start a little bit backwards by explaining the mirror URL. This is kind of like FeedBurner's pure, uncorrupting vanilla state with none of its archaic features enabled. Can you tell? I don't like FeedBurner's features. If you're using FeedBurner in its raw state with nothing checkmarked, it's okay to use. In fact, there could be good cases to use it. But features like SmartCast or Title Burner or things like that, if you enable those, that's when it's causing some problems. But this URL that you get from Apple as your mirror URL will usually follow a pattern like HTTPS colon slash slash PCR, which I theorize stands for podcast redirect dot Apple dot com slash ID and then some string of numbers, which is the ID for your podcast. You would see the same kind of numbers inside of your iTunes URL. This mirror URL they give you is a simple 302 temporary redirect to your main RSS feed URL. That means that if you enter this mirror URL into a browser, you'll be redirected to that main RSS feed that you see in the URL field, that RSS feed you're using for your podcast. But the way that it redirects it doesn't assume that you should always land on that destination URL. 302 and 307 temporary redirects are different than a 301 permanent redirect. Other than permanent and temporary, what this actually means for you is you use a permanent redirect when you want everyone to always go to that new address whenever they try to visit the old address. You want that indefinitely in the future. That's when you use a 301 redirect. But a temporary redirect is when that destination, that final 
landing page might be a different URL at different times. For example, I currently live stream my recording sessions of the Audacity to Podcast on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern time over at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash live. When you visit that, that's a 307 temporary redirect that takes you to a different URL each week, and it's the URL for this particular live event. And I realized this actually only recently, that I had it set as a 301 redirect, which was not good, because I didn't want slash live to always go to an old live event. I wanted it to go to the latest live event, so I changed it to a temporary redirect. Here's another way of looking at what a temporary redirect is. It's like a temporary forward of mail at the post office. You may not have permanently moved homes, but you do want everything going to that old address to be automatically forwarded to the new address without notifying the sender of a permanent change of address. And at some point, you then may go back to the post office and say, okay, I'm home now. You can stop forwarding my mail. And then they'll continue delivering the mail to your main address. That's what a 302 or a 307 temporary redirect is. Thus, this means that once your podcast is in iTunes, you could potentially submit the mirror URL feed that they give you from Podcast Connect to other podcast directories and maintain control of your RSS feed without other third-party tools like FeedBurner. But If you have control of your feed URL already, like you're using PowerPress, you're using Libsyn's RSS feed, or maybe you're even already using FeedBurner, please be using it in the vanilla state unless you're not working with Libsyn or PowerPress or anything good like that, then you don't need the mirror URL if you already own that feed URL or you have control over it to redirect it to wherever you need it to go. So the mirror URL is kind of like a feed burner replacement in that it can redirect to somewhere else. So I can change where it goes based on the feed URL that is in the URL field inside of Podcast Connect. Now, this is a dangerous field because it doesn't do what you might think it does. Some podcasters might think, oh, I need to move from from website A to website B. So I'll go in here to Podcast Connect, I'll change my URL field here, and all of my subscribers will come over with me. No, that is not what happens at all. To be clear, and I put this in bold letters in the show notes for this episode at theaudacitypodcast.com slash podcasts connect, changing your feed address in the URL field will not redirect your existing subscribers. This change will affect only your directory listing in Podcast Connect platforms, and new subscribers. If you want to shift everyone from subscribing to your feed from website one to subscribing to your feed from website two, then you need to put a 301 redirect on that actual URL they're subscribed to. Changing your mirror URL will not do it for you. That's as of February 2016. And it seems, as of right now, that none of the Apple podcast platforms actually look at this mirror URL for subscribing to podcasts. So if you search iTunes and subscribe to a new podcast, it seems you're subscribed directly to that podcast's feed, not to the iTunes mirror URL. But here's my hypothesis that might be uh, what Apple will change. Actually, I, I do predict that they will change this in the future so that when people subscribe to a podcast, they're subscribed to your mirror URL and you can more easily change where they're getting the podcast feed from. And I could see that if Apple does make that switch, they may have a way of even changing existing subscriptions. So if you're subscribed to the Audacity to Podcast right now in a Podcast Connect platform like iTunes, the podcast app, Apple TV, anything like that, there might be something that Apple could do because they make those software programs. They could do something that looks to see, oh, you're subscribed to the Audacity to Podcast RSS feed. Let's push out this update, cross compare it to the listing in iTunes, and then resubscribe you to the mirror URL, which would not have any adverse effect on you as a subscriber. It would not 
necessarily have any adverse effect on me as a podcaster either. It does mean that if Apple does this, and again, this is all theory, hypothesis, whatever you want to call it. If Apple does this, then it does mean I would be able to someday change my feed URL inside Podcast Connect and it would affect my existing subscribers. Right now, that's not the way it works. And even for them to get it to that point that it works might be a little tricky and it might not catch everyone. So really, we come back to if you need to redirect your feed URL, changing it here in Podcast Connect is really not the best way to do it. Here's another way of thinking of what mirror URL is doing. Imagine the mirror URL is a magical door in front of your home. If you tell people to walk through that door, they will arrive at your home, regardless of where that home is. But right now, everyone is already at your home, so they don't need that door. They don't have to go through it. They're already there. That's the way it is with your podcast. Everyone is already subscribed to your RSS feed URL. They don't need to resubscribe to your mirror URL. You don't need to ask them to resubscribe, anything like that. They're already where they should be. But it is possible that an update from Apple would force everyone to start using that door, that magical door, the mirror URL, in such a way that it wouldn't make any difference to them. They might end up walking through that door and not realizing it. That could be coming in the future. I don't know for sure whether it would come. But still, the best way to redirect your RSS feed is not changing it here in the Podcast Connect. So think of it this way. The URL field inside Podcast Connect is really, for your information, telling you what feed iTunes is pulling your podcast from, which is really helpful there so you don't have to subscribe to your podcast and do some weird things to try and get your podcast RSS feed from your list of subscriptions and that kind of thing. You can very easily see it, copy and paste it here, especially if someone is helping you with your podcast. But changing this URL is really only changing the source for your mirror URL and your directory listing in the Podcast Connect platforms. That's iTunes, the podcast app, and such. I might have overwhelmed you with my use of URL here and mirror URL, but please look back at the show notes at theaudacitypodcast.com slash podcasts connect to review this information if you don't quite understand it. So a question you may have right now is, what should you be doing if you want to redirect your subscribers to a new RSS feed? The best way to do this is to use a permanent 301 redirect on the old feed URL. The second best way to do this is to use the iTunes new feed URL RSS tag inside your old feed. But that will only affect Apple's podcast apps and a few other podcast apps out there, but not all of them. The last resort is that if you have no option to place a 301 redirect on your RSS feed and you can't put in that custom RSS tag inside your original old RSS feed, then your last resort is log into Podcast Connect, change the URL, But remember, that's changing only your listing, not your subscribers. Then release a last episode in your old RSS feed and tell your audience to resubscribe to the podcast, to go back to iTunes, resubscribe because you've changed some things and they need to resubscribe to continue receiving new episodes. But this is a massive inconvenience to your audience. So it does mean that you could lose many subscribers along the way. And depending on how long you leave that old RSS feed up, you could lose a lot more subscribers because they may not hear your announcement until it's too late and they can't download that new episode anymore. So it's best really to place a 301 redirect on your old feed. If you can't do that, use the iTunes new feed URL on your old feed. If you can't do that, that's when you use the mirror URL and the URL field inside of Podcast Connect. Complicated, I know. Here's the short of it. Don't touch it. (laughs) Don't mess up your podcast listing in iTunes by trying to change the feed URL inside of Podcast Connect. If you need help with that, then please contact me through the website, theaudacitypodcast.com, and I can help you fix your RSS feed if you're having some problems. Please don't break it by changing that URL in iTunes. So that's Podcast Connect. Podcast Connect. 
and the confusing features of URL and mirror URL that I know I spent a lot of time on, but I really felt it was important to explain the details there and when you should or shouldn't use it. But Apple did release some other neat new things for podcasters. First of all, they completely revamped the podcast resources and help section that used to be on apple.com. It's now much more thorough and much more resourceful and helpful. They have some getting started guides. They have a section for podcasts connect news, which is great because if you don't receive the emails from Apple, you still have a place you can go to see, oh, what's new? They have a frequently asked questions section that I'm sure they'll be expanding as they get more questions frequently asked. They have really handy resources in there as well, like the podcast partner search that lists several different podcast hosting companies and certain features that they offer. And guess what? Libsyn and Blueberry have the most check marks of any of them there. That's why I recommend Libsyn and Blueberry. And if you want to sign up with Libsyn or Blueberry, then use promo code Noodle and you get a free month with either of those companies. And if you have any problems there, any questions, please let me know. I'd be happy to help you with that uh, to help ensure that you're using it properly and taking advantage of the services that they offer at Libsyn or Blueberry. And they also have a new method for receiving support from Apple. It used to be that you would email a certain address that was kind of hidden on the website. You really had to dig around or hear it from one of the podcast consultants. Then they switched to a ticket system. Well, now they're back to email-based support. But when you click on the contact us link or the help link, or depending on where you go, when you click on that link, it pre-populates an email message with a template and you're supposed to go in and fill out the information on that template. It's the kind of stuff that Apple really needs in order to help you and it helps speed up the process for getting help from them. So instead of just emailing them and saying, my podcast is down and then they email back saying, well, can you give me us your RSS feed, your podcast listing ID, the name of your podcast and that kind of thing. And that takes more time, that back and forth, it can be really painful. Instead, you can give them a lot more information up front and their new message templates tell you what kind of information you need to give them so that you can speed that process along. Now, not everything in the new resources and help is immediately visible from the main page, like the new page for RSS tags for Podcast Connect is a little bit buried. And there's also a section about the submission status messages that you might see and what each one of those messages means. That's a little bit buried too. But this is a whole lot better and provides a lot more help for podcasters than it ever did before. And if you have issues with Podcast Connect or its platforms, then please consult this documentation before you contact Apple. There's a lot that this can help you with, and it'd be best for you to help yourself and probably faster for you to help yourself Or you can work with me or one of the other podcast consultants out there to really help you fix whatever problem you're facing. And I have links to these different resources that you can check out in the show notes for this episode at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash podcasts connect. Next is HTTPS support. This may not affect you, but for a little while there have been some issues with the Podcast Connect platforms supporting HTTPS. That's a secure hosting for different stuff. That could be that your podcast feed comes from an HTTPS URL. It could be your podcast episodes were hosted on a secure server or your cover art was on a secure server or anything else like that. Well, now iTunes and all of the other platforms with Podcast Connect do fully support HTTPS. What you need to do, though, if you're using HTTPS on a domain you control, is remember to keep your certificate renewed. If your HTTPS or your SSL certificate expires, then there could be problems with your podcast. So be careful there. Just make sure that you keep that certificate renewed and there shouldn't be any problems. The final update from Apple as of February 2016, is that at the same time while they were making these front-facing updates with Podcast Connect, some new documentation, a lot of that other cool stuff, and they told us about it, they have made some interesting updates to their podcasting specifications, which they now call RSS tags for Podcast Connect. And I have a link to that in the show notes for this episode if you're interested in seeing the new page with the new RSS specs. A few changes here that are important 
is one Apple now recommends cover art be 3000 by 3000 pixels. They're not requiring it necessarily. They do still say it needs to be a minimum of 1400 by 1400 with a maximum of 3000 by 3000, but they recommend that you go for that maximum 3000 by 3000. But if you hope for your podcast to be featured and this is most likely in places other than the mythical magic of new and noteworthy, then Apple does require that your cover art be 3,000 by 3,000. They also require that your podcast cover art have no Apple branded content, like an iPod, an iPhone, an Apple logo, anything like that. And they have some other requirements that are more strict for being featured That's not to be in iTunes. To be in iTunes, you need cover art to be a minimum of 1,400 by 1,400. To be featured by Apple, you need your cover art to be at that maximum size, 3,000 by 3,000. But the second thing about this is that Apple doesn't say it specifically. They do say to compress your image so it works on mobile devices, but they don't say what size that is. Rob Walsh has confirmed that it still seems to be that your file should not be any larger than 500 kilobytes. So if you're working with a 3000 by 3000 image and you want to get it below 500 kilobytes, then you might need to use a little bit more file compression in your JPEG settings, or you might need to even adjust the image a little bit more so that it compresses better. In general, the more detailed an image is, the more file space it will consume So try to remove textures, use solid colors instead of textures, or use uh, solid colors instead of gradients if you can, that kind of thing. The fewer colors there are in the image, the less texture there is, the more pixels there are together that are the same as each other, then the smaller that file size can be. The third important thing to note is that Apple has officially, finally clarified the iTunes explicit tag. There was for a little while some question about what's going on here with the explicit tag because we noticed a lot of podcasts were being automatically marked as clean, no longer being unmarked and not being marked explicit. And it comes back to this iTunes explicit tag in the RSS feed. And this is very important. There is no blank option anymore. If your show was previously untagged, or maybe it was tagged and it said no or false, then it's now automatically marked as clean. I don't know about you. I could probably guess, but I don't actually like how black and white this now is because it means your show has to be clean or explicit. So you really have to question whether your content is truly clean and kid-friendly. And that's the thing to think about is don't start thinking, well, Can you squeeze in or can you allow this mild profanity into it? Think about it like this. Is it truly clean if it has even mild profanity in it? If you can't confidently say, yes, it's truly clean, then unfortunately, it means you have to mark it as explicit. You could edit it. You could bleep it out. And side note here, if you bleep out only the vowel of some profanity or obscenity, Everyone knows what word is still being used, so it's really not like masking the profanity anyway. It's just removing a single vowel. I think that's a bit legalistic to say it's no longer profanity if you remove only one letter. That is, (laughs) no pun intended, but that is really trying to follow the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law. Bleep out the whole word so no one has any idea what word was said. That can make your podcast then clean and appropriate to carry the clean tag. I wish that there was an in-between, like maybe that we had rated G, rated PG, rated PG-13, rated R, uh, that kind of thing, like in TV or movies, where we could have multiple degrees of ratings. There will be those podcasts where you're still going to have to question, should this be marked as clean or should it be marked as explicit? That's tricky, but you really need to decide. Think of it this way. Can you truly confidently call it clean And can you call it kid-friendly? If yes, then give it the clean tag. If no, then it needs that explicit tag. You can, however, still have individual episodes marked differently from the entire show. But do keep this in mind. 
There are some countries that don't allow explicit content. India is one of them, but there are several other countries as well. And that means that if you have an explicit episode in your podcast and the rest of your podcast is clean, that could mean that your podcast will be removed from some of those other countries. Or you could do something like use the iTunes block feature on that individual episode so it won't show up in the iTunes directory listing, but it will still go out to your subscribers and thus it won't get you banned from iTunes. You might want to use that in the case where you have a clean podcast, but you have one explicit episode, or maybe you have an explicit podcast and there's one episode title that there's no way you can work around it. You have to have profanity in the title, which Apple does not allow at all in the iTunes store, regardless of what country it's in, regardless of your explicit tag. But if you absolutely have to have the profanity or obscenities in your title, then you could use the iTunes block RSS tag for that individual episode. So it won't show up in iTunes as a directory or the podcast app directories, and it won't get your show booted from iTunes, but your subscribers will still receive it. That ability to block an individual episode has been around for a while. That hasn't changed. But how you use the explicit tag has changed. From what I can tell, most of the other RSS tags have remained the same. There are a couple tags here and there where Apple has changed their explanation a little bit, made it a little bit more clear, which is good, or they've uh, clarified what's per episode or per show only. Now, it's important for you that whatever you use for creating your RSS feed stays updated and with the correct values for these different settings. That could be PowerPress or Libsyn. They're staying up to date with this information and giving you the proper control over these tags and images and such. But FeedBurner's SmartCast feature, for example, which is really the true crime of FeedBurner, not FeedBurner itself, but the SmartCast feature, it's really dumb cast, but that incorrectly presents you with three options for the explicit tag. That would basically be cleaned, blank, or explicit, but now the blank and cleaned will both show a clean tag. Also, SmartCast still recommends that your podcast cover art be 300 by 300, not 3000 by 3000 as it really should be, or that's best to be. So if you have extra questions about Podcast Connect, feel free to comment here on the show notes for this episode, number 258, at theaudacitypodcast.com slash podcastconnect. If you want some more discussion on Podcast Connect, then definitely check out a recent episode that Ray Ortega, Todd Cochran, and I did of Podcasters Roundtable. It's kind of a half episode, but we discuss more some of these changes and theorize and a lot of the same stuff that I talked about here in this episode we talked about over there. But if you want a little bit more perspective, that's a great place to go as well. And I have that link in the show notes. A little side note here, if you're inside Podcaster Society, you have access to a new video overview that I did of Podcast Connect, where I show you how to use different features in Podcast Connect and give you a little overview of the different features and where they tie in with different things so that you can manage your podcasts better. Podcaster Society isn't open to new members yet, but it will be open later this year. So you can go to podcastersociety.com and join the waiting list to be notified when it is open next. But I'm having a blast producing new content, developing new things, upgrading things inside Podcaster Society. But as much fun as I'm having, I'm waiting until I am absolutely confident this is ready for the rest of the world. So if you're in Podcaster Society right now, then you're in the ground floor of something that has so much more coming to it. And you get to see everything else before everyone else does. I have these links and others at theaudacitypodcast.com slash podcast connect and that's also where you can go to share this episode if you found it helpful for your podcasting or to help clarify these things or if you have some other questions about podcast connect i can't promise that the information is accurate for very long because at any moment apple could change things so if there are any updates to this information i will be sure to put it in bold near the top of the show notes to say update and then let you know what's been updated about the information. But once again, you can go to the audacity to podcast.com slash podcast connect to get that information. 
and to leave a comment there if you have any further questions about Podcast Connect. Special thanks to MTK3 from the United States of America who wrote a kind review for the Audacity to Podcast in iTunes. They said, super content. I avoided this podcast for a while because I thought it was based on Audacity software. (laughs) Yeah, I've heard that a lot. Boy, was I wrong. Daniel has terrific content backed by his extensive experience, well-organized and complete, but succinct. A definite must for podcasters. Well, thank you very much, MTK3, for that kind review in iTunes. It really encourages me and it helps other people find the podcast as well. If you'd like your own podcast reviews from all 155 iTunes stores emailed to you automatically, plus Stitcher and more to come in the future, then sign up for my podcast reviews at mypodcastreviews.com. Now that I've given you some of the guts and taught you some of the tools, it's time for you to go launch or improve your own podcast for sharing your passions and finding success. I'm Daniel J. Lewis from the audacity to podcast.com. Thanks for listening. The Audacity to Podcast is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Like, did you know the TV series Once Upon a Time is coming back very soon, or it might already be back by the time you're listening to this? We have a podcast about that. We also have a podcast about Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Agent Carter and the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe. We have a couple podcasts helping you to be productive in your professional life, in your personal life, 